Hello everyone, welcome and uh, this is a webinar which is going to introduce the subjective visual vertical, a test of the vestibular system that is new to the, the interacoustics uh, lineup and so what we'd like to do over the course of the next 45 minutes approximately is just unpack some of the basic principles of this test and some of the, uh, the clinical applications to help develop your understanding. My name is Michael Maslin and I'm an audiologist and an international clinical trainer with the Interacoustics Academy. And we're a group of audiologists interested in providing a training and education in the various different clinical applications uh, for, the, for the various different diagnostic tests, both audiological and vestibular. And as I mentioned, the one particular test that we're, that we're interested in today is the subjective visual vertical. So. This slide here attempts to just run down the content of the talk. We'll start off by providing a discussion of the, the underlying principles of this particular test. And then just by way of a, well, a video demonstration, uh, then uh, I'll, I'll just show uh, how, how the test is actually performed, how it's measured. And then we'll move on to discuss a little bit of uh, the interpretation of the results, both under uh, normal circumstances and for some common peripheral uh, vestibular abnormalities. Um, although the test isn't limited to um, the peripheral vestibular system, but it's also sensitive to a range of central disorders as well, and so we'll touch on those. And then we'll just close at the end with a brief summary as to how the subjective visual vertical fits into the wider test battery for vestibular testing. Before we get on to that, then uh, let's just unpack some of the basic principles. So now what we see on here is a, uh, in the bottom left within the hatched uh, yellow box is a simplified schematic of the inner ear. And the two red arrows that emerging from the box there um, are meant to illustrate where in the inner ear the utricle and the saccule are located. And the utricle and the saccule are collectively the, the otolithic organs and they're responsible for sensitivity to a linear acceleration. Uh, be that a translational movement or merely the linear acceleration due to gravity. And as you can see from the schematic, simplified as it is, then there's a broad division of labor between these two end organs. While the saccule is primarily orientated in a vertical plane, and so it's able to sense an upwards and downwards motion, as well as a left and right, the utricular organ is primarily orientated in, in a horizontal plane and so it's able to uh, sense forward and backwards type motions as well as left and right. So there's a, a broad division of labor here and but the, the test that we're interested in this today, the subjective visual vertical, as you can take from the name, it has something to do with the visual uh, system. So part of the inner ear that um, is innovated uh, by the uh, to the eyes, the vestibular ocular reflex is the main innovation pattern stems from the utricle. So when we talk about the subjective visual vertical, in large part we're talking about a test that's sensitive to function of uh, the utricle. Now this is a scanning electron micrograph that I've taken from uh, this wonderful library um, where there's a, a range of different uh, pictures of the, the inner ear, both the normal inner ear as well as um, the way the inner ear looks after various different pathologies. It's known as the Hawk Library and it's a website that you can uh, log on to and I strongly recommend you do. Um, and this is one picture that I've just taken from there as you can see from the citation at the bottom. And it's, um, it's a, a picture of the utricle in uh, a mammal, in the chinchilla. And uh, We'll have a look at a schematic in just a moment, but what we can uh, just see here is uh, the utricle with the otolithic uh, membrane removed, so that uh, we're, we're peering down on top of uh, the sensory epithelia, which is a sheet of, of hair cells, and the stereocilia from those hair cells protrude upwards. And normally they would protrude into uh, the otolithic membrane, but that's just been peeled away for the purpose of um, our observation here. Um, but what you may be able to make out approximately, uh, but just off center, but approximately around the midline of that uh, utricle is a, um, is a, is a, 
an area with a slightly different um, tone, a shade, and it's an area where the uh, the hair cells are a little thinner. And I'm just using the uh, the mouse here to just direct your eye. And this is known as the striola or the midline. I highlight this here because it's a very important um, concept that there's a dividing point around which the hair cells are positioned. And just for your interest, if you direct your attention over to the left of the scanning electron micrograph, then you can see um, this is the, uh, the cupula from one of the semicircular canals that opens into the utricle here. Um, and this is the, uh, well, sorry, this is the crista with the cupula removed. Um, but going back to the utricle a moment, so normally on top of the utricle there's a, a gelatinous membrane which covers this whole area. And the gelatinous membrane is embedded with these crystallized uh, calcium carbonate particles, which sort of range in size somewhere between around 3 to 30 or so microns um, in diameter. And what these calcium carbonate crystals do is they lend a certain weight or inertia to the membrane so that it allows sensitivity to uh, linear accelerations or translations and gravity. So on this slide here, we're actually having a look at the, uh, the utricle, but now in cross-section. So at the bottom, we see these red lines represent uh, the nerve fibers which go off to form the uh, vestibular nerve. And they, of course, connect to the sensory uh, hair cells. And you can see um, the stereocilia at the apical um, uh, end of the, of the hair cells protruding into the gelatinous membrane. Um, this is the, uh, the yellowed area that I'm just highlighting here. But embedded into the gelatinous membrane are those calcium carbonate crystals that we were just looking at a moment ago in the previous slide. And a very important concept that we should take from this slide is here we can see the uh, striola just uh, highlighted here, just slightly off center. And on one side of the striola, we can see that the orientation of these hair cells is opposite to those on the other side of the striola. So that the, um, uh, the, 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 the orientation of the, the largest stereocilia, the tallest one, the kinocilium, is um, pointing towards the uh, striola. And that, that's going to be a, a very important point in a few moments when we have a look at the, the way in which um, the utricle functions. So please just bear that concept in mind for a moment. Before we get there, I would just like to point out uh, that this, this um, again, simplified schematic here of the uh, utricle, and you can see the striola highlighted with the yellow line there, and then the arrows are pointing towards the orientations of the, the different hair cells that are arranged across the, uh, the sheet, the epithelial sheet. And so that you can see from this uh, simple slide that each utricle uh, of course, there's one on each ear, is multidirectionally sensitive so that some uh, hair cells are orientated ever such um, a slightly different position compared with their, their neighboring uh, hair cells. So a head tilt or, or a forwards backwards motion, a uh, bowing of the head or a, tilt, a tipping backwards of the head will primarily activate some hair cells but less so others. And it really just depends on the particular uh, plane of uh, the, um, those hair cells with respect to the type of head movement that we're, we're showing at that moment. Um, but as I said also, the, uh, there's a utricle on each side. So this pattern of innovation and uh, the, the pattern of um, hair cells arranged across the sensory epithelia is mirrored between the two ears. So what this means is, for instance, if I was to uh, move the head in this roll plane, so that means tipping the head from side to side as if you were placing one ear on one shoulder and then the other ear on the other shoulder, then we might maximally stimulate the hair cells in this particular plane as I've uh, highlighted here, but any hair cells that are orientated in this plane will be much, much less uh, well activated by that particular type of movement. And then, but vice versa, uh, on the other hand, if we were to pitch the head forwards and backwards, then those um, those hair cells and the innovation, uh, the, the 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 nerves that connect to them, would be much less um, stimulated than those in the role plane. And so it's rather like a spectrum. 
so that there'll be a, a, a gradation of, um, of activation as we move around the different parts of the uh, sensory epithelia and uh, so any one particular movement will end up being coded in a very producing a very particular pattern of, of innovation when we look at the pattern on a global scale. Now if we think a little bit more about the uh, um, about the effect of all of this on on the eyes now um, of course we have to think about the functional purpose of the vestibular system and uh, there's a number of them but two of the key ones will be to um, maintain a stable image on the retina during movement and of course also to maintain the correct posture both statically against the uh, ongoing force of gravity but also dynamically as we ambulate through the environment but let's just for a moment think about uh, the eyes and leave uh, the postural um, issues to one side for the time being since this is a talk about the subjective visual vertical so what we have here on the uh, uh, center here is we can see the position of the head and it's static and upright with respect to gravity and the force of gravity is acting downwards as you can see from uh, from the arrow there and the eyes that I've just schematically shown above they're orientated in parallel with uh, gravity so that uh, the top of the eye is pointing upwards and the bottom of the eye is, is downwards and um, in large part this comes about because of the ongoing tonic neural activity that arises from the utricles on each side and so we see the utricle on the left here um, shown with the, the blue nerves and then the utricle on the right shown with the red nerves and then the little um, uh, the, the, these little uh, train of uh, nerve spikes here what they show is a tonic activity arising from the, the nerve fibers on each side of the striola on each ear as I'm just pointing with the, uh, with the, with the pointer there and so when the head is upright without any movement then we see a balanced tonic activity arising between the two ears so it's approximately the same between the two ears and of course a balanced tonic activity arising within each ear but on either side of the striola so everything's nice and balanced and what that leads to via the uh, the reflexive vestibular ocular uh, reflex connections is tonic muscle activity in the various extraocular muscles that are innervated by the utricle so that they're held tonically in place and uh, and then um, the, and the eyes are they're not just uh, spontaneously or um, then they're, they're not just there um, in, in a kind of passive way but they're actively held in position and here is uh, again a very simplified um, but for the purposes of our, our discussion it's more than more than adequate but a simplified schematic of the the linear vestibulo ocular reflex and what we see in the uh, bottom left is just a, um, a, a, a simplified um, chart showing approximately equal activation or, or an equal tonic amount of nerve impulses arising from uh, the left and the right side and that leads to an equal um, a tonic muscle tone in the extraocular muscles now here's what happens when we tilt the head so the, uh, the, the, the calcium carbonate crystals that we were referring to earlier that lend this extra density or weight to the uh, otolithic membrane the act of tilting the head now leads to a shear force which moves the membrane with respect to the, uh, to the sensory epithelia beneath and this leads to uh, a deflection of the stereocilia of the hair cells and then corresponding um, increase or decrease in the nerve firing according to whether the, uh, the stereocilia were bent towards uh, the, uh, the, the, the kinocilium on one side of the striola or away from the kinocilium on the other side of the striola so if we just draw our attention for a moment to uh, the left hand side then what we see for a left head tilt is a large proportion of these hair cells uh, um, having their stereocilia bent towards the kinocilium and so that leads to an increase in nerve firing on those, on those particular nerves 
whereas a sm smaller proportion of hair cells on the other side of the striola, they're having their stereocilia bent away from the kinocilium, and that leads to a decrease in the nerve firing accordingly. Now, all of this uh, activity is mirrored, but in an opposite pattern on the right-hand side. So a left head tilt for the right leads to um, a large majority of, um, of uh, hair cells and their nerve fibers uh, reducing the activity, reducing the number of nerve spikes, whereas a small, small proportion on that side will be excitated, and then the nerve firing rate increases. And what this does, in uh, the net effect of this, is to lead to an ocular counter roll. So as we can see here, for a left head tilt, the, the, the eyes are, are bent or, or uh, directed torsionally by an equal and opposite um, amount to the right so that they continue to be um, aligned in parallel with gravity. And this effect, as I said, is called the ocular counter roll. And I've just uh, shown here the net effect, uh, so in the bottom uh, chart here, of all of this uh, changes on each side. So just to reiterate, on the left we see a larger proportion of, um, uh, of stereocilia uh, are, are bent away from the kinocilium, causing an increase in activity, but a small proportion show a decrease. And the net effect of this is overall an increase in uh, activity, a compound asymmetry results. On the right, the net effect of all of this is um, a reduction in activity. And then the ocular counter roll arises because this asymmetry in the linear VOR leads to an overall increase in activity that's driven by the side to which we've tilted towards and a corresponding decrease in activity on the side to which we've tilted away from. And now I'm just going to go through the same concept but this time just to show the effect as if, as if we were tilting the head to the right. So a rightwards head tilt leads to, again, a shear force on the membrane of both the left and right utricle. But on the right utricle, we've got a net effect of an increase in firing because the majority of hair cells on this side will be excited, uh, leading to an increase in, in nerve firing on the majority of them. And a, and a decrease on a smaller number of them. On the other hand, on the left-hand side, the side which we're tilting away from, then the majority of these hair cells on this utricle, um, uh, uh, the firing rate will be reduced on the nerve, um, whereas a smaller number, the, the firing rate will be increased. And all of this leads to, again, an ocular counter roll, whereby when we tilt the head here to the right, the eyes will torsionally uh, deviate back to the left to keep them orientated in line with gravity. And again, just to uh, hopefully make the point crystal clear, then here we see the effect of a rightward head tilt um, and the net effect as a, of a compound asymmetry in the firing uh, rates between the VOR arising from the right ear and the left ear. And the net effect on the right side is an increase, shown by the thick red lines, whereas the net effect on the left side is a decrease, shown by the uh, dotted blue lines. And all of this leads to the appropriate um, uh, contraction of the, and relaxation of the various extraocular muscles to produce uh, the, the ocular counter roll accordingly. And here we have uh, a video of yours truly which uh, demonstrates this. So you can see me sitting here with uh, the uh, VOG goggles on and uh, you see on the screen a picture of my eyes and if we just play the video. So a rightwards head tilt um, and then a leftwards head tilt. But what we see is uh, that the eyes remain orientated vertically throughout. I'll just play that again just to make sure that uh, everyone was able to catch that. The right was head tilt, but keeping your eye on the on the eye, then 
aside from uh, a few beats of nystagmus as I during the tilt, then you can see that the eyes remain orientated vertically with respect to uh, the plane of gravity. So this leads us to the uh, discussion of the test itself, the subjective visual vertical, because we can measure uh, someone's perception of a vertical, um, but in the condition that they don't have any other visual cues, so all of the uh, um, all of the information in the room that they're sitting in is blocked out, all of the visual information, um, and they're only provided with um, a line, as you see here, shown on the left. And if the eyes are orientated vertically with respect to gravity, then the line should appear to point upwards to that person. And, and so we can simply test this, and we can test it with the patient with the head uh, static and vertical, as this lady is sitting here. Um, but also we can test it with the head tilted to one side or the other, as you saw me doing in the previous video. So how the uh, test itself works is that the patient simply wears this uh, goggle instrument, um, and the goggle does two things. It produces a, a, a virtual line, so a projection of a line, as you see, um, and it also measures the... Uh, the, the angle of the head, whether the head is static and upright, like in this patient here, or is it tilted in one direction or another. And with a hand control, um, you can see uh, the picture of the hand control on, on the right here, then the, the patient is asked simply to, with the arrow keys, position the line um, in, in their perception as, as to uh, upright or the, uh, vertical. And um, they do that with those uh, arrow keys, so they move the, uh, the line to the left or the right. And when they think that um, the, the, uh, the line is positioned vertically, then they hit OK, and then that stores that particular result. And so if there's balanced activity between the utricles on the left and the right, then whether they've got their head straight or whether they've got their head tilted to one side or the other side, they should always have the ability to point the line vertically. And after we've done this demonstration, I'll then show you what happens when there isn't balanced activity between the utricles. But we, we haven't got quite to that stage yet. I just want you to understand how the test works under normal circumstances. So what we're going to do now is just play this video to show the test procedure. So what we have, I'll just uh, talk through what's going on on the screen here. We have a patient who's wearing the goggle set, and um, they have uh, uh, started the test procedure. And the first stage of the test procedure is that they're static with the head uh, tilted, or, or the head straight up, should I say. And we can see that the head is tilted straight up because this uh, display over here shows the arrow pointing upwards towards uh, the zero point. In other words, the head is vertical. It's just actually a little bit to the left of vertical by 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees. And this display on the right, this shows us an image of what the patient is seeing inside the goggle. And so remember, it's pitch black. There's no visual cues other than this line. And what the software does is it randomly orientates the line to a, pl a point off vertical. So we can see here it's just jumped the line over to the, the left there. And, the, uh, um, and the, 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 the patient's job is to use those arrow keys. And you can see uh, the, the button pressing going on here. And the patient's job is to reorientate that line with a vertical. And it's quite common to do this. We can see here um, four or five different uh, repetitions. And what we see is the, uh, the deviation angle plotted on the chart in the middle. So what we have across there, on the x-axis here, we have the, uh, uh, the head angle. So we're, we're currently uh, with the head at uh, zero degrees. So we'll see points um, arising just on this uh, zero axis here. If it's just to the left or the right, then that's because the head isn't perfectly at zero, but it's just to the left or the right of zero. Um, but on the, on the y-axis, we have uh, the deviation angle. So how close was the line? to vertical. And if we see 
that the point falls on the zero or close to it, then the li then the line the patient orientated the line that they see very close to vertical. If it was uh, above the zero point, that means it was just to the right of vertical, and if it was below the zero point then on the y-axis, that means it was just to the left of, of vertical. So what we do is we build up a picture by having a number of different test conditions, with the head's uh, here orientated at zero, but it could be that the head is bent over, tilted over to the left or to the right um, by a number of degrees, 15 degrees, 30 degrees, 45 degrees. So there's a number of different test conditions and the relevance of that will become important later. But we do a number of repetitions and then we take a median uh, result and that's the, the number that you see um, appearing or the values that you see appearing in the, uh, in the center of the chart here. And so I just go through five repetitions with uh, the head zero and then we have just zoomed forward to show the result as the head has been tilted to the left and the right by different amounts. But I'll just unpack in a little more detail what happens if there's a unilateral weakness. So on the left of the uh, schematic here, again we have, uh, we see here that with the head um, static or orientated straight up, then the eyes are held in position because of um, equal activity on the vestibular ocular reflex. And I've only shown the vestibular ocular reflex here in the, the yellow uh, lines represent the, the, the neural pathway stemming from the right ear, but um, a symmetrical uh, response would arise from the left ear. But of course, on the right side of the screen, then this shows what happens when there's a left unilateral weakness. And now what we have is unopposed activity arising from the now healthy, remaining healthy right side. And because it's unopposed, then this draws the eyes to tilt over towards the side of the deficit. And this effect can rather be seen on this uh, schematic here, because here we have that left deficit, and we have uh, no tonic or no uh, no spontaneous firing arising from from that side, whereas the intact right side continues on as normal. In fact, it might even be that the um, amount of activity from the right side increases a little bit, certainly in the acute phases immediately after an abrupt uh, unilateral weakness. And so we have a compound asymmetry in the neural firing between the two ears, which normally would be coded as a rightward head tilt, and a rightward head tilt would trigger the ocular counter roll to maneuver the eyes to bend over towards the left. Of course, in reality, there is no rightward head tilt, the head is straight up, but the reason for the asymmetry is because of a pathological weakness on the left. So there's um, an ambiguity here, a normal rightward head tilt and a pathological weakness on the left produce an asymmetry in neural firing and that's what leads to this inappropriate ocular counter roll. And so now, if the patient was to do the subjective visual vertical under the same conditions as we just saw, where they didn't have any visual cues to um, orientate themselves as to which way uh, up was, really, um, but with visual cues removed with the mask on, then they're only uh, relying on the uh, their only remaining um, sensation of vertical, which is the gravity receptors, the utricles, um, but the utricles are, of course, here showing an asymmetrical firing pattern. So the eyes would be bent over and the person would perceive vertical as tilted over towards the side of the deficit. And what would happen if we uh, tilted the head over to uh, the left, so over towards the deficit, is that um, the, the effect would become even greater and uh, the, the ocular counter roll would, would increase so that uh, the, um, the subjective visual vertical would be even further away from the real vertical. Whereas if we were to tilt the head over to the right, then this would partially counteract at least some of the effect so that there might still be a subjective uh, vertical tilted over towards the side of the deficit, but it would be reduced. And the reasons for the effect I showed on the previous slide 
and the effect that you see on this slide is because of the remaining activity that's sensed in the healthy right ear. And in the uh, previous slide, if we just go back to that for a moment, um, we can see that the majority of uh, the hair cells are driven to an inhibi inhibition, but a few of them uh, are excited because they're on the opposite side of the striola. The compound effect, because the amount of excitation that you can achieve is a lot greater than the amount of inhibition, is a large asymmetry between the two ears, larger than when the head was straight up. On the other hand, if we tilt towards the healthy side, then um, the majority of uh, stereocilia are now excited, and this largely counteracts the pathological asymmetry, and it pulls the eyes back towards uh, the center line. And so um, the, uh, the left-sided pathology is rather counteracted by uh, the, the right-sided uh, healthy ear and, the, and the, the normal asymmetry that results as a result of the fact that the striola is just off midline. And so um, for someone with a leftwards uh, unilateral weakness of the utricle, then what we might expect to see if we were to do the subjective visual vertical on such a patient would be a result like this. So here we have uh, the head is straight or static, or at least very close to, just, just a few degrees off to the left, the patient had the head when they did this. And, um, but with the head straight, the, eye, the, the eyes were bent a little bit over to the left, something on the order, if we were to have a look at this dark black circle and read across to the position on the y-axis, something on the order of four or five degrees tilted over to the left. Now, if we bend the head over to the left or tilt the head over to the left, and you can see from the chart here, that's uh, um, as we move over on the right on the chart, on the x-axis, then the effect gets even greater. So the more we tilt the head, the greater the eyes are deviated from vertical. On the other hand, if we tilt the head over to the right, over towards the healthy side, that is, then the, 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 then the effect of the um, firing pattern that I described on the right side tends to counteract the underlying asymmetry due to the left weakness. And so the eyes are pulled back nearer towards um, the, 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 uh, the true vertical. And in fact, taken in isolation, you can see that these results are within the normal range. But overall, if we have a look at the picture overall, um, then you can see that irrespective of where the patient had their head tilted, the eyes were always tilted somewhat over to the left, and they were tilted a little bit over to the left when the head was tilted to the right. They were, even when the head was straight up, they were tilted a little to the left. And then when the head was tilted over to the left, then the effect got even greater. This is the effect or the pattern that we might expect to see on someone with a right unilateral weakness. And you can see that it's exactly the mirror image of what we were just looking at. So that when the head is tilted uh, uh, to the right, then uh, the, uh, the, um, the position of the eyes moves even greater to, towards that uh, deficit. And when the head is tilted to the left, the effect is counteracted. But either way, the eyes in this person with an acute right-sided weakness are always uh, subjectively, uh, the, the verticality is always perceived a little to the right, and that's because the eyes are physically bent over to the right. So I've just um, shown, just now in schematic format, um, those three different conditions. So we had uh, in the center here, we have normal uh, responses or balanced activity from the two utricles, and that led to a perception, a, 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 an accurate perception of vertical, whether the head was straight or tilted to one side or the other. On the other hand, if we had a left unilateral weakness, then the eyes would be tilted over to the left, and the effect would be greater if the head was tilted to the left. On the right-hand side of the screen here, we see the effect of a right unilateral weakness of the utricle. The eyes were always bent over to the right, and the effect is even greater when the head is also tilted to the right. Now, what you may have surmised from the discussion so far is that um, 
the, the effect here of the subjective visual vertical being tilted over is driven to a large extent by a tonic or a spontaneous asymmetry between the firing pattern of the two ears. And in the acute phase, after a unilateral weakness, and in this, as you can see here, we're shown an acute left-sided unilateral weakness, then we might expect to see a very large asymmetry between the two ears. But over the course of uh, a number of days and weeks, then uh, a very fascinating and interesting process of um, neuroplasticity, uh, changes in this spontaneous um, firing rate take place such that there is um, a, a rebalancing of the tonic or st spontaneous um, activity between the two ears. And what that means is that over those uh, days and weeks, and it can take in some individuals, you know, perhaps a month or even a couple of months um, to, to reach its complete, complete state, but what will happen is that uh, the, um, uh, the, the spontaneous uh, activation between the two sides will gradually rebalance, and so the effect of um, ocular counter roll or inappropriate ocular counter roll is, is diminished. But you can see here that the effect is still more apparent with the head tilt, and because that, of course, exacerbates the problem, the, the, the underlying problem. So that if we um, have a, 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 a spontaneous um, uh, rebalancing or, st or static compensation taking place, and then we, if we were to just do this test with the head in the zero p tilt angle pointing upwards, then it may come to, to mask an underlying problem. But by tilting the head and adding these additional test conditions of tilting the head towards the suspect ear and away from the suspect ear, then we can increase our sensitivity uh, to an underlying problem, um, despite the fact that um, some static compensation may have taken place to, to, uh, uh, to, to mask the effect. So now we'll just uh, run through some of the key clinical applications of this subjective visual vertical. Hopefully you can see on the slide here um, a number of the key applications. So of course, first of all, um, we've, uh, as you may have surmised from the, a large part of the discussion, we're talking about um, a test which is sensitive to uh, the, the, uh, the function and the resulting innovation pattern um, leading from the utricle. So if you had an individual with isolated utricular dysfunction, then this would be you would think a very good test to do. It may not be just isolated utricular dysfunction. It may be that there's um, a more global uh, unilateral weakness, for example, um, associated with uh, labyrinthitis or, or vestibular neuritis, um, or indeed any other insult to uh, the, the, the branch of the nerve that innervates the, uh, the utricle. So it could be that there's a central uh, disorder, such as multiple sclerosis, um, as, uh, which I've just um, labelled there in the top right, any, any disorder that might affect the um, superior vestibular nerve and neuropathy of some description. Um, just uh, draw your attention to this one. This is quite an interesting one, a vestibular schwannoma. Uh, so this is a, a tumour, it's a benign tumour, uh, it's a space-occupying lesion that grows on the vestibular nerve. Um, and uh, but it grows rather slowly, such that the process of uh, static compensation can often mask any underlying um, problems that result from the space-occupying lesion um, compressing the nerve, restricting blood flow, and so on. So um, because uh, the, uh, the subjective visual vertical, as we saw from the previous slide, is gradually less and less sensitive to a, de a deviation, um, due to process of static compensation, then that, that's an interesting one because under some circumstances it may be a useful test and under other circumstances not so. Um, any other neurological disorder that affects any other part of the vestibular ocular reflex uh, pathway um, might well um, be reflected in a, an abnormality in this test. Um, so Parkinson's or any uh, lesion such as hydrocephalus where the fourth ventricle in very close proximity to the um, vestibular nucleus uh, and, and, and a range of other neurological disorders could affect the subjective visual vertical. Uh, Meniere's disease uh, is, a, is an interesting one because this is um, 
an example of uh, an episodic type of um, peripheral vestibular disorder. And so this test might well be sensitive to Meniere's disease if you were to test the patient during an episodic period. But if you were to test the patient um, during a period where they were not episodic, then perhaps not so. Um, and as well as uh, the initial diagnosis, it might well be useful, this test, for uh, tracking recovery, tracking compensation. So in summary, any type of uh, fixed deficit and some uh, both peripheral and uh, central uh, fixed uh, asymmetries between the two ears and depending on your timing, it may also be uh, relevant for um, rather than fixed but episodic conditions such as many as disease as well. Okay, so I can see that the time's rapidly running away from me, so I'm going to um, move through uh, just to uh, uh, some more comments as to the clinical applications and then close with a, a brief summary. So in the role of the modern vestibular clinic, then we have a number of jobs that we can summarize here. So uh, identify any lesion within uh, anywhere within the vestibular pathway, make a differential diagnosis, uh, monitor disease progression, which may be relevant from the point of view of prognosis, um, managing expectations, particularly if uh, any residual function is particularly limited, guiding the, uh, the management strategy, especially if, re if rehabilitation involves um, physiotherapy, and of course monitoring um, recovery. And in a modern vestibular uh, clinic, then that can take on a number of guises, all of those points, but at its heart will involve at best some way to assess the semicircular canals both left and right ears but independently um, and uh, so the, the, vis the vi video head impulse test of course springs to mind here um, we also have uh, the caloric uh, test of lateral semicircular canal function and uh, rotary chair and the whole video nystagmography test battery of course and then when it comes to the uh, utricle and saccule we've got a number of different test options there and, and the subjective visual vertical fits in there and on top of those ways to uh, independently test the five end organs of the vestibular system and the superior and inferior branches of the nerve that innervates them but of course we've also got the, the cochlea as well so often a, a vestibular appointment will involve some form of hearing test as well. So with respect to the, uh, the utricle and the saccule, what test options in addition to the subjective visual vertical do we already have and where does the subjective visual vertical fit in with all that in mind? Well of course we've got the OVEMP, that's one test and I specifically point on the ovum because that's, a, that's often associated with um, sensitivity to utricular disorders, whereas the CVEMP is um, often associated with disorders of the saccule. And the ovum is, uh, has a lot of advantages. It's uh, um, not just sensitive to a unilateral weakness of one ear or the other ear, but bilateral weakness, um, many ears disease, uh, third window syndromes, and a range of central disorders as well. But the OVEMP is rather time consuming when it comes in comparison to the subjective visual vertical. The, the demonstration on the normal patient that I showed you earlier, the full video, uh, lasts less than 10 minutes. So the test procedure is less than 10 minutes. Um, in addition, there's a number of um, uh, contraindications to OVEMPs or potential contraindications, um, such as uh, a sensitivity to uh, the loudness of the sound, hyperacusis, if someone has tinnitus. Um, possibly if someone has a conductive hearing loss that prevents, at least for AC, uh, conducted sounds reaching the, uh, the inner ear. So that, that can be a problem, whereas the SVV, the subjective visual vertical, doesn't suffer from these issues. Moving to the middle of the screen, we see uh, this off-axis vertical rotation. So what we have here is where the individual sits in a rotary chair, and the rotary chair spins around where one utricle is on the axis of rotation, and the other utricle is off the axis and so the opposite utricle is then deflected dynamically um, by uh, centrifugal forces. So that gives you an ear specific way of um, testing each utricle in a similar way to, to, the, uh, um, to, the, to the tilt, it's just that the tilt isn't ear specific. 
but of course the uh, the rotary chair equipment is very expensive the procedure is time consuming it's not portable um, so again in relation to the bedside type of test that we have here the SVV then the, these tests the OVEMP the off-axis rotation and the SVV are very much complementary just finally the head heave well um, that's not, not not found I wouldn't say a great deal of clinical traction because it's very hard to uh, slide the head from side to side because the head's on the neck it's not difficult to do that with the video head impulse test because it's a rotation of the, of the head on the neck but a sliding from side to side is a lot more difficult you can position the patient on sort of a sled and slide them forwards and backwards or side to side in that fashion but of course that doesn't lend itself so well to uh, clinical applications so that's where the SVV sits in it's much more of a bedside portable fast um, uh, test with particular emphasis on a unilateral weakness on one side or the other and another test of um, the uh, uh, utricular function is the uh, test of skew because in addition to the ocular counter roll then there are two other reactions that arise from an asymmetry in the uh, in, in the, the function of the utricle there's the skew of the eyes where um, the, uh, the, the eye to the side of the tilt moves downwards and the, the eye to the, uh, to the opposite side of the tilt moves upwards as you can see on the schematic here and, uh, and the third reaction, the third component of the um, ocular tilt reaction is, the, is the, the head skewed on the neck here but that's difficult to see clinically, it often resolves quite quickly but the ocular counter roll that we test with the SVV and, the, and uh, the skew of the eyes both can be tested clinically the skew of the eyes is tested with a procedure known as the cover uncover test and um, what happens is if there's no skew like on like you see on uh, the left hand side of the screen then if you cover and then uncover the eyes then the eyes will remain where they were there was no skew whereas if there was a skew now when the pers person has uh, visual cues to direct them then the skew will be suppressed the eyes will be in the central position but if the eyes are covered temporarily then the eyes will then skew and if the eyes are then uncovered then the eyes will then move back to the central position so the cover uncover test involves um, looking for a vertical movement of the eyes according to whether you're um, covering the left eye or, or the right eye and that particular test is a key component of the so-called HINTS protocol um, and there's this uh, recent uh, paper um, by uh, Newman Toker and others um, discussing the future of the HINTS protocol and one of the key um, future directions that uh, discussed in this paper is, um, is quantifying the results the first part of the HINTS protocol <laughs> is the head impulse test and this can be done clinically by just looking into the eyes rotating the head and um, observing for any resulting saccade any corrective saccade and that can be quantified using the video head impulse test so that's well covered but then we have nystagmus and again nystagmus can be done at the bedside the test of nystagmus can be done either um, uh, with the patient just looking into the uh, examiner's eyes or with fixation removed by the use of frenzel lenses um, and, and then the resulting spontaneous nystagmus is observed um, at the bedside but it can be objectified by using these goggles video oculography just like we were showing earlier in the video and so that's what the authors recommend there but when it comes to uh, the test of skew then the, uh, the authors don't go on to explain how that might be quantified how that might be um, uh, um, moved forward from the traditional cover uncover test but of course one way that we could consider is to introduce the subjective visual vertical now it's it's not the same test it's measuring uh, the ocular tilt reaction but it's measuring the, uh, the the torsion of the eyes rather than the skew of the eyes but the two effects are caused by the same underlying asymmetry so when it comes to using the the hints protocol and uh, these three tests here are, uh, the, they're used to differentiate an asymmetry in the VOR that could be uh, due to a, a benign peripheral loss as against something more serious such as a, 
a um, as such as a, a, a stroke in the in the brainstem region. And so it's possible that maybe one way to uh, advance the Hintz protocol um, and uh, and uh, quantify the uh, um, the the ocular tilt reaction could be to to add the subjective visual vertical, and that would be a very interesting development. So I thought I'd mention it here. Now, just finally, um, as to how the uh, the VOR from the linear response integrates with the uh, the VOR from the angular response, the canal VOR, then here we have um, on the x-axis uh, we have um, the the speed of the head rotation or uh, head movement in frequency as against the VOR gain, and uh, the, uh, the 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 VOR for the linear uh, response differs in a number of ways to the the angular response. Um, one of the ways is that it's more sensitive, or um, it has a lower frequency of uh, sensitivity and a, a slightly lower uh, cutoff frequency. So there's this band pass for the angular VOR um, versus uh, the low frequency response from the from the linear VOR. So I'll just thank you now for your attention, and uh, just in a moment I'll invite any questions. But just to close with a brief summary, so we've covered uh, the underlying principles and some clinical um, uh, scenarios or interpretation of some clinical results, a unilateral weakness to one side or another as measured by the SVV, a fast and portable way to um, assess utricular function, and hopefully um, you, you uh, can see the way it might add to the test battery in the ENT or neurology departments, but also, as what I was saying, with the HINTS protocol, potentially in the emergency room as well. Um, it could be a very useful test from a triage point of view um, and also monitoring recovery, particularly static compensation. It may also be uh, used in non-clinical scenarios such as uh, screening in sports or, or, or other type scenarios like that. And also you can see from the pictures here that um, it's uh, potentially very child friendly as well. Um, it can be considered a bit of a game amongst children, I believe. So, um, so as regards the uh, the, the uh, age range, then the lower age limit would be where um, the child can, you know, cooperate and push the button and uh, follow the instructions accordingly. Perhaps three to four years old and, and upwards. If anyone would like to unpack any of these uh, details that I've provided um, in, in more depth, then uh, I'll just refer you to these uh, references. And I'll now just close by inviting any questions and also thanking you for your attention. Thanks, Stig, for your question. Can SVV replace OVEMP? I know there can be problems to get good OVEMP results. I think that's a very interesting um, uh, question, so thanks there, Stig. But in a word, no, I don't think that they replace one another, um, but they're complementary, and, and that's one of the key messages that I would like to uh, convey. So um, the, 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 the OVEMP is um, a, an ear-specific test, and um, it provides uh, information not just on unilateral weakness, but on bilateral weakness. It provides information on whether or not there's a third window syndrome. So what I mean by that is something like a semicircular canal dehiscence, perilymph fistula, anything where there's an abnormally high amount of sound energy that's allowed to pass through the inner ear, and that gives an abnormally high amplitude um, OVEMP. And, uh, and simultaneously an abnormally low threshold OVEMP. And the SVV wouldn't be expected to be sensitive to those um, pathologies. And similarly, the Meniere's disease, where we have the ability to plot a VEMP tuning curve. In other words, to compare the amplitude of VEMPs at the same level but different frequencies. And when someone has Meniere's, the pattern is different to when someone doesn't. And, and, and so the, the SVV doesn't have the ability to tap into these different types of pathologies. On the other hand, the SVV is much quicker, it's portable, it has um, perhaps, you might say, um, a place uh, in the test battery 
higher up. Um, it, it, what I mean by that is if you were to be doing any type of screening or triage of patients, then perhaps the SVV would be the first um, test that you might turn to. And if there was any indication of any uh, further abnormality that um, you didn't think the SVV was going to help you to unpack that any further, then the OVENT might be the one that you turn to next. So they're complementary with one another, and I don't, I don't think that, um, that, that one can replace the other. Okay, it doesn't look like any further questions are coming in, so um, perhaps we'll just draw things to a close. But thank you once again, everyone, for uh, your kind attention. Um, really grateful that you took the time to, to tune in, and I hope it was worthwhile for you. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much.